anybody who is watching a number to go in so before i set up the baseline why don't you guys introduce yourself because it's always fun with greg and on down the line i'll start i guess you want to start we're used to hey, when let's scott. go this is how we usually go i'm yeah, scott Rouse, we... and i'm a body language expert and analyst and a trained law enforcement in the military and interrogation and body language mark I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language. I help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, gain credibility every time they communicate, including some of the leaders of the G7. Chase. Hey, I'm Chase Hughes. Did 20 years in the U.S. military, wrote the number one best-selling book on behavior profiling, interrogation, persuasion, and influence. Greg? I'm Greg Hartley. I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor, I've written 10 books on body language and behavior, and I spend most of my time on Wall Street or corporate America. Okay, good. And now I see that people have rolled in because it takes time to get this rolling. Um, as I said before, I want to give everybody or as many people as possible an opportunity to get a question in in the chat. But in. obviously the chat is going to be chatting amongst themselves. So to help me in my quest, folks, please type in the word question. And it could be all caps, it could be smaller, just a flag so I know that, hey, this is a question for the panel. And then if you would, please specify whom you would prefer to answer, because it will take a while to get through all the questions, and I want to get as many as I can, and going one, two, three, four for every question will add a lot of time that won't be fair to people. One last thing, Super Chats, I deeply, deeply appreciate it, but if I can't get to them. There's no guarantee that it's going to get asked if it's a super chat and I don't want anybody upset. So if you want to do super chat, just to make sure you donate and I'll do the best I can. I appreciate it, but please don't donate if it's going to bother you. So on that note, Mark has a dead camera battery. <laughs> We're starting there. So yeah, let's see if I can get another camera back in. How about that? Okay, no worries. While we're waiting on that, wh what's the show this week, guys? Well, it's going to yeah. be this guy named Gable Tosti, and he was, um, even though he was acquitted, his his the his Tinder date jumped off the fourteenth floor balcony of his apartment after they had a big fuss, and he was uh, wrestling around with her. Uh -oh. And so that's what we're talking about. His so we're back to just murder or mayhem instead of a lot of everything else this week okay yeah. so a little less on the dr phil front and things like that okay yeah. cool got the, some questions coming in first off question i really want to know if greg or scott can answer what it is with women who are moms doing the sway when standing in groups well that people will it, it's part of matching and mirroring they sort of lock into each other and so they'll both start going back and forth and it's not always the the, the same I, i've seen that video you're talking about it's not always they're always not locked up together but everybody who's bored is going to stand there and sway back and forth uh, quite often but if they're if they're good friends and they're hanging out and they've been talking and stuff they're probably the one who can see the other one is is in that case i think one is just ahead of the other one they'll sort of sway back and forth together greg what do you got yeah two things uh, a lot of women who are mothers have done that with a child to calm the child so it becomes kind of a, a soothing thing for them the second is if you're part of a group you tomorrow can introduce some weird gesture, weird illustrator, and the rest of the group will pick it up. It's just the nature of humans. All right. And this one's for Scott. There'll be a time limit. Scott, what got you interested in psychopaths? Uh, <laughs> dealing Music. with so many of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Really. Dealing with so many of them and not understanding why that person was acting the way they were or, be or, or behaving the way they were. And I, and I started reading about them and there wasn't a lot of information about it what we know as a psychopath, what people call a psychopath. But that that's what I did. It was just being fascinated by how they acted and how they didn't care about a, a lot of things that, that normal people would be empathetic toward. And I couldn't understand why they were like that, and I've just never gotten past it. You know, okay, this is this person didn't label, and I'm not following the rules, but okay, what's the best episode? Who's going to rat out their favorite child? Uh, Prince Andrew. Oh, yeah. By okay. far. That's good... We did too. <laughs> I kind of like today's... the Alec Baldwin. Today's was my favorite because I think there was a lot of hidden stuff there and it shows that 
somebody who might have that uh, potential uh, could still go free. All right. Um, question. How do you disconnect from the horrible things you hear in interrogations? Greg, Scott, Chase, draws straws. Well, I, I think you're there for a purpose. And each of us probably should take a quick shot, but you're there for a purpose and you should have a box around yourself when you go in there. Anyway, you're there to get information and to figure out what happened and to hand that over. So it's a job. That's just the way you got to treat it. T tomorrow, guys who pick up garbage, don't take that home. None of the rest of us are doing that either. You have to be able to isolate. There's certainly a, an impact, but you have to be able to isolate. Chase, you, you're more recently in the hot box than most of us. So. Um, I think in any interrogation that you, is, I'm, I'm not a compartmentalizer. So I just kind of change it, just kind of reshape the way I view the world, that this is just something that happens. And it's, this is just something that happens in the world. And that's just kind of the way that I see it. Scott? But I, I think when you go in, I agree with Greg, you have a job to do. And so you can't let your emotions get a part of that. Sometimes you do. And, and, and you, you may make a couple of decisions that later on you'll think, well, that could have gone wrong if I, if, if, you know, if thank God it worked out the right way, but it's, you have a job to do and you do that and that's it. And you leave that there. You can't bring that to the house because as soon as you do that and things start getting weird. All right. Uh, I'm going to go with Ziggy and Ziggy shrugged. I'm going to interrupt and steal time because Ziggy Shrug made this for me. Wow. Oh, how nice. That's cool. And oh, nice. I yeah. cannot tell. It actually goes in the transom above my door there. It was a really, really nice. kind gesture. Um, she's on my locals, but her question is for Greg. Greg, when you suspect there is something that is being hidden, what is a sure telltale, telltale sign that they don't want you to ask about it? My, my favorite indicator, because I'm very auditory, is when someone speeds up to get past a topic. So they're normally talking slowly. I ask a question. They think it's past, and they speed up their cadence. That's my best indicator. That means I want to slow down. Well, hold, hold on a minute. Do, do a Columbo. Well, hold on a minute. <laughs> <laughs> it's just exactly how I like to do it. Okay, I love this one. I'm, it's for anyone, but I'm going to go with Mark because he's been very quiet. All right. Can you detect narcissism? I'm going to say with just audio. With just audio, well, you, you, you're going to be able to detect it from the words that people use. But can you can you in you know and the ideas that they have and um, you know within some certain boundaries? But could you pick it up from the inflection and tonality of their voice? Not to my understanding. No, uh, it's going to be in the language and and how self self referential uh, it is. So it's something it's not immediate. You kind of have to get a little bit more exposure. You can't just pick it up in a five-minute conversation necessarily. Well, the right five-minute conversation, yeah. No, yeah. If you, you know, if you if you if you can if you can get get onto a subject matter whereby it would most likely uh, trigger some uh, the narcissistic complex to express itself faster, quicker, more boldly, then absolutely. But but uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether the question there was, uh, can you can you provoke somebody into a situation where they're more likely to express their 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 narcissism? Yes. Can you pick it up from the tune of their voice? You know, the vocal fry, the whatever it might be, to my knowledge. No. OK. OK. And I might be picking the order of the questions, so I don't know if I'll read anything <laughs> into this or not. But um, Chase, please give us a rundown on what is motivating Binger. At the Rittenhouse trial. Which one is Binger? He is the <laughs> chief prosecutor. Uh, I think it's just, uh, it looks to me that like his behavior suggests a strong desire for personal achievement, a feeling of social significance and power. Okay. Yeah, let me so see. a lawyer then. <laughs> <laughs> a prosecuting attorney. Does Mark look like with that jacket on? Does Mark look like a, a manager of like a metal band from the eighties? Is it just me? No, I, I was thinking he was working on his super criminal status for the next Batman thing. I thought it was a good look. That or a, a magic show. You know, I still get comments about Mark's that. first appearance, saying he owns a T-shirt. Yeah, I've dressed right. up for you tonight, Eric. I, I, and I, I, I don't need this kind of. I don't need, need this. No, I, 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 hold on, hold on. I dressed up. I'm wearing my Tiger King shoulder special. There you go. 
And That's, I, oh, yeah. I even framed the, the book. So I couldn't believe I just, that. That's funny. I couldn't believe somebody sent me that. Famous and then shoulders. you sent me that. That was so that was so weird. Of course, I went upstairs and ran upstairs and turned on Netflix and watched it. Yeah, I did too. I had the, the quickest turnaround minutes. ever. It's like, wait, I made the oh yeah. Oh. <laughs> that worked. Yeah. yeah. Okay, weird, so didn't it? Oh, uh, which one of you guys would be worse face under an interrogation? Don't understand. Greg. Worst to face? The worst to face? God almighty, I wouldn't have Greg asking me questions. You kidding I, I me? I think it depends on what you've done and See, how... it's already started. Yeah, it depends. This is the way they do depends. it. Just depends. Yeah. Right. If it's a yeah. sex crime, it'd probably be me. I think it just depends on the person, <laughs> what you've done, and where, whether we would be aggressive psychologically. Yeah, see, like he's smiling real big and all that. Oh, yeah, it'd be okay. I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure it would. If things would be okay, I'm here to help you, man. I want to help you get out of this. Man, I wish I could read I, it. I care. Yeah. I do care. I really do care. Yeah, you do. <laughs> <laughs> all right. This is a good one. Um, I, I love the Pareto principle, but is there one behavior that alone gives an 80 20 rule in ID li lying or deceit? I can do that. Yeah. Cool. Uh, is it different than the person's normal behavior? And does does it directly answer the question? That's it. Those those two things would probably be the highest leverage things that I won't speak for the other dudes here, but I I would give that advice as the highest leverage. I think it's a great way to sum it up because there isn't a single behavior. It's anything that stands out. Okay. Is that like the Nabarro rule that um, you're looking for discomfort from a baseline? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's, yeah. You're looking, looking for, for change. It doesn't discomfort. have to be discomfort. Right. You're just okay. looking for anything that could signal that there is some, some difference there. So not, I don't think necessarily discomfort is, the, um, is exactly the thing to go for, though it's, though it's probably more prevalent. Yeah, I, I did an interrogation. Where the the guy comes in the room, calling me bro and dude the whole time, dude. and then all of a sudden I start asking about missing money, and he's like, "Oh, sir, no, sir, absolutely not, sir, no, sir. <laughs> I'm sorry about that, no, sir." Mm. So, I, I, lo I love when you go. Yeah, that's when a you change. go to another when you go to another country and people learned English from watching TV. Their speech oh. patterns can be so weird. It's just yeah. strange the way they talk to you. So sometimes you can have Sean Penn of Fast Times talking to you. <laughs> or the Brady Bunch, or yeah, oh, God. <laughs> so or crazy. combination. I would love that. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, I don't know what this is, but have you ever interviewed anyone associated with facilitated communication? Don't know that term. I, I do think you need I, to I think clarify you're about facilitated an, an communication. Greg and I probably have, if you count interpreters. Is that yeah. what you mean by that? Because I you think, have plenty of interpreters. Or do they mean like the one of the voice box things? Don't know what maybe means. both can either of you answer know. on that i don't know well interpreter there's a process i mean we teach there's a process you know me everything's a process if you are going to work with an interpreter there more there's more than one method you use you can do simultaneous or you can just alternate and there's a process to doing that how you ask the question how you set up your next question how you look, watch for body language how you retrieve information while they're doing it and even if you speak a foreign language my Arabic was decent once upon a time. I still want an interpreter because it gives me free time to think while that interpreter is asking the question. So, yeah, it, there's certainly a process to do it, and it, it's repeatable. I mean, I can, we can put something up to show you. I'm going to throw mine in there, too. It's one of my favorites. What about reading the interpreter themselves? Part of the job. We One of our jobs, especially with people who already speak Arabic or whichever the other language you're in, is to vet the Terp. You got to make sure the interpreter, the interpreter is saying what the person is saying. You just don't tell them, you know, and then when you come out, you fire them if they, if they're doing something crooked. I had a situation come up where I was dealing with, with uh, a couple of Chinese guys, they're businessmen. Let's just leave it at that. And so I called Greg. I was like, Hey man, I, I, I've never worked with an interpreter before. And, and Greg told me, make sure you tell the interpreter to tell, to tell you exactly what they say. Don't dread, don't change it. Don't make it shorter. Don't make it longer. Tell them exactly exactly what you said translated even if it sounds odd translate it that way word for and, word yeah and, and don't change pronouns don't say he says if he says i you say i we force the interpreter to use exact language because we lose nuance otherwise oh okay yeah that makes sense 
That makes sense. Because then it's interpretive. Um, okay, this one, uh, back to Scott. Scott, everybody wants you and psychopaths and psychopathy. I, I don't know, man. Chaff and redirect. All Looking right. So, Greg's phrase, trying to be all, I got a haircut. It's like, look more like Chase, and I'm trying to be like a. Scott, you're going to love this question. Yeah. How do you tell what the difference it? between someone who's just introverted from a psychopath with no there's emotion? A, there's a huge difference there. Introverts don't act, don't act like that. They're, Introverts most likely aren't going to be um, narcissistic. They're just going to be quieter. They're not going to go out and do a lot of uh, that person, personality type isn't one to go out a lot, isn't want to be a lot, around a lot of people, doesn't want to go out and do anything really that, that's fun. They might want to do fun things, but not as, as um, actionable with a bunch of people, whereas the psychopath is going to want to be around a lot of people because they need that adrenaline rush. They need, they don't have any feelings. They don't get anything except from sex, drugs and adrenaline. And you probably get the adrenaline from both of those uh, from the first two. So an introvert, it's, I see where you're coming from because they seem like they're quiet and they're just looking around and, and not saying much, but that's, that's the opposite. Most of, most of the time of a psychopath, because they want to be part of something. They want to be, they want to find the spot they can get in and take advantage of or, and get whatever they need and or want from that person. So there's there's really really big difference in that. So so don't confuse that because you're dealing with narcissistic personality. All psychopaths are narcissists, but not all narcissists are psychopaths. I gotta say that part of it. And the introvert is is most likely isn't gonna display many of those behaviors you'll see from a psychopath at all when they're when they're in public or when they're doing things. Even if it's just a small group of people together, uh, the introvert's still gonna they'll be a little bit more talkative and and, and relate a little bit more. But the psychopath will be the one who is who will take the alpha role or try to anyway, and that'll be the that that would be the difference. One of them's not going to do a whole lot; the other one's going to do a whole lot. Okay, I've got one, and I want to put it out there because of the Elliot Smith coverage that we're doing and things like that. What about, and this can be to any of you, somebody who's an addict who is on drugs and has that flat affect, like a heroin addict or something like that? How do you cope? with that type of situation when you have um you know some sort of adulterating substance with their behavior you wait i mean that's a super ridiculously short answer but i think that would be the the solution for everything is just waiting it out but if you if they're not arrested you don't necessarily have that opportunity they can go get another fix so i i, I mean i'm just kind of yeah i mean you got to be you want to be really specific about the situation because um cuz cuz you know addicts and users and can do all kinds of things in all kinds of situations they mm -hmm. they don't have just one set of behaviors you put them in one situation they'll behave in such and such a way they'll be you know they, they put them in another situation they'll be very very different if they've just taken you know a hit they'll fall asleep it's, it's and, like, and in, in some circumstances if if they're on drugs they can't enter into a, a confession that that stuff as, as many times has been thrown out in court because they were on drugs or high on something uh, besides potanus and they made the but if you are if you are looking for an answer from an interrogator in an interrogation where our hands are tied in certain situations in intelligence we don't have that problem we just put them back in the box and leave them for a while but if you're talking about in, in your daily life i think chase is right if they're going to come down then you got to wait otherwise you've got to learn what's baseline for that person in that situation and look for what's different some people never change we dealt with someone recently that you could tell drinks a hell of a lot a hell of a lot and when you're talking to them you could see that they're either hung over or the best part was all the bleaching of the eyes and that kind of stuff when you're dealing with those folks their eyes look unnaturally white and all that kind of stuff and we could tell but you can't do anything about it we've got a window to talk to this person everybody's different i've met some super functional crack addicts who who you just wouldn't know but they're consistent users at a certain dosage level totally fine running running good organizations in some cases so it's just often difficult to to tell i'm okay. a corporate guy there's plenty of high functioning alcoholics there well uh, and military too yeah um okay uh gavin everybody knows gavin and yeah. he wanted to say hi earlier so he's saying hi, hi now but hey gavin 
Amen. Um, can you tell us the best way to deal with biases when you're close to someone? Well, I think it doesn't matter whether you are close or you're at a distance. You need to try to disprove whatever it is you think. I will tell you, in recent, two of the recent things we've covered, and I won't go into detail, but in two of the recent things we covered, if I had gone with bias, I would have had a very different opinion than I walked away with. And you just got to challenge why you think that at every turn and look for reasons why what you believe is wrong. And if you do that, it's almost like you're doing a, an experiment anyway. You'll either find the evidence to support what you're doing or the other way. Sometimes it just jumps off the plate at you. I'll tell you the one with that uh, young woman in Australia, your gut automatically goes to the mother is the parents are involved. You ought, your gut goes there and you have to look and seeing just that body language tell me something different was powerful. And another one recently, same thing. So, so the very simple technique that I use and train other people in is you is you got this little voice in your head that will talk about people. So you see that 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 mother and the parent the the, the step parent of the kid, and your instinct will go well. Obviously X Y Z, and all you do is put the word in your mind perhaps at the end of it. Just put perhaps at the yeah. end, yeah, and and then you start to explore. So I, I do that with all people. You try and do that with most people most of the time is that they'll be talking to me and I'll have this judgment going on in my head and I just put perhaps at the end. If I want to do the work of suspending judgment and if I don't, I make my judgment and on I go with life. It's a lot quicker. It's a lot quicker to make the judgment. It's much slower and more expensive to do critical thinking and use perhaps. And, and if, if you ask yourself, have you ever been wrong? If you've never been wrong, you've been wrong. Yeah. <laughs> well, that answer no. right there would be wrong, right? I mean, exactly. exactly. <laughs> we we all make I'm... mistakes. Yep. So usually this, a strong awareness of your own psychology is typically the best steering wheel away from bias. A strong awareness of bias and understanding there could be bias here. This guy looks like me. His name is the first. He has a first, first name is me. And just a, a strong awareness, I think, is usually for me the best steering wheel uh, away from yeah. Yeah, just every meeting you walk into, every situation you walk into, you say to yourself, I'm biased. How am I going to manage that? That's all. You don't walk in going, well, I'm not a judgmental person because you just made a judgment about yourself. You just got into your own tautology and, and destroyed your own idea. So I'm biased. And how am I going to manage that is, is, is the first step, I would say. Awesome. We got a fan for you here, Mark. Um, they love your video where you're in soccer pitches. Yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I encourage everyone to check that out. Uh, Mark has a very spirited runner. Yes. Um, let me see. I have Indeed. one. Both. Okay. This is a great one. Who have you done a video on that you didn't expect to believe, but did? McCann's. Yeah. I, I would say that. I'd also say Cleo Smith's parents. Okay, and you're still getting flack about the McCanns, aren't you? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Every day. Yeah, I mean that—that's—that's that's one of my favorite payroll. things. We're on payroll. I, oh, I yeah. love. Um, I, I love the um, fact that everybody's commenting because it adds engagement. But it's like, you, Peter Hyatt said, blah blah blah, and it, it's like they're trying to get this little cage match between Peter Hyatt and you guys, and it's like. I don't think anybody disagrees. Nah. I and mean, you've been on with him, but it, it is a very fun oh, he's thing. He's a great guy, man. Yeah. Oh, we he's like a fantastic fun, guy. fun guy. And at least the Smith, you um guys, you know, kind of won. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that had to feel pretty good. I'm sure that everybody rushed back to apologize for their earlier comment, right? Oh, yeah. Well, the thing yeah, is, we were showing you the red flags that were popping up and saying, this doesn't look right to me. And here's why it doesn't look right. It's still okay at that point. Yeah, yeah. Because I learned, and they'll see what they learn is red flags, and they'll 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 just stick by those and go, oh, this means this, and they'll stick right by it because they think they see something. And well, they won't wait a while and listen and, and go with it and see what happens next, or take into consideration what that situation is. Well, the whole so, idea yeah. of a red flag is, is, is probably a really bad metaphor anyway in in any analysis. Because it's so binary, it's either a red flag or there's nothing at all, rather than there might be a whole bunch of gradations in, in between. Yellow, and like, well, red flag, all right, everybody run around like headless chickens because there's a red flag. It's like, it's probably the whole metaphor of red flags is probably just a bad idea. We, we use it as much as anybody else does, though, because it's, it's fun, isn't it? 
because it's like, well, you can just go red flag and, and done, dusted, onto the next one. But it's not yeah, it, a great idea. Well, interrogation is about getting the most information in the shortest period of time. We're watching a video and we're looking for what would I dig into if I were sitting across from this person? Why would I suspect this person? And then you have to take that apart. I think the funniest, Eric, is that, yes, even though we were right, now people come back and say, well, you should have never, you should have never analyzed her in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we would have a pretty boring channel if we didn't analyze folks who are <laughs> under question. All right. Now, I hate questions like these, but I have to be fair and bring it up. What's my tell? Eric has no tells. No, but yes, he go. does. I'm going to tell you what it is. <laughs> go for it, man. I don't care. Not well, Eric still blushes, so that's a good thing. Okay, Eric, you ready? Sure. What you do is when you're not sure about something or you said something you shouldn't have, you start talking and you talk about that. You'll, you'll say something to, to ping the person you're talking to is what are their subject is and relate it to what you, what you just talked about, but you'll talk all around that and then move on to the next, move on through it. That's why so I think I've you seen mean your right. shirt is what you're saying. Yes. Oh, yeah. okay. Doesn't so everybody have to redirect. <laughs> I mean, well, that's uh, yours. That's okay, you. well, I mean, but doesn't everybody do that, including you? you. Get, but you get all <laughs> animated and stuff when you when you do too. I watch okay. a lot of your shows, man. Eric's Eric's number one physical tell would be a postural retreat. A what? I would agree with that. Yeah. What uh, is that? So, like, yes. what, like what Greg just did, like oh. just kind of, oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know what you're saying, no. Um. All right. Cool. Uh, da, 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 da. let's see and then of course uh, losing my place for the next thing all right lisa franceschi uh, yeah i think i said the right do you all always agree or sometimes have different opinions considering the behavioral profiles have the same meaning obviously i know this answer sometimes we disagree you know yeah. sometimes we do yeah, we don't. The thing is, we don't if have a we meeting. Didn't, what are we? What are we going to think about this? We wouldn't Go be ahead, experts sir. if we didn't. I would yeah. say we would be faking it if if we That's didn't right. disagree. Yeah, and, we had some. There were... We recently we had a couple. I mean, where something yeah. comes up where one of us says this, another person says, "I don't see that." When you hear us say, "I don't see that," that is disagreement, guys. It doesn't mean that we think the other person's an idiot because they see something differently than we do. That's the piece that I, I love about this group is we respect each other's opinions and where we're coming from and how we got here. But we don't always agree on everything. Yeah, Greg had a pretty strong disagreement with me in this video we did that came out today. Mm. I love that. I mean, if we didn't disagree with each other, we would not have science. We wouldn't have right. medicine. So that's where that comes from. I think that's why I like hanging out with lawyers. Because is that it? Is you like to disagree? Like it's almost more entertaining when... You do have some degree of friction and you can learn or be like, yeah, well, wait a I minute, think what? that sharpens. I think iron sharpens iron. So, you know, we're in there disagreeing and then that leads to a debate that wouldn't would not have otherwise occurred uh, without that disagreement. Yeah, I think what we're doing is is we're not shying away from disagreement. Uh, and we're not trying to create it because it might be dramatic. I mean, the thing about our, our, our show is that the drama's already there. There's already usually somebody's been killed. Or some, mm. some, something really bad has happened. So the drama's already there. We don't really need to create another drama. What we're doing is trying to explore and think about what might be going on. And if there's some slight differences, that's okay. And if there's strong differences, that's okay as well. We're not going to uh, agree with each other just because it would be better. But I guess our disagreement isn't going to be a violent one just because it might make a great bit of YouTube. For, for everybody. I think we kind of think that wouldn't be great YouTube if we were violently disagreeing. But we could, you know, we could try a show like that while we were no, we on could, purposely Mark. violently we could. disagree. Yes, we no, could. We could. That's no, stupid. No, Come on. Chase, be a fool, Scott. I think we need to do one episode where we're in person and we and we all pass around a bottle of whiskey and about hour three, then we film the episode. And we oh, yeah, that'd be a fun one. Drunk profiling. <laughs> Right. Yeah. As soon as I'm finished throwing up. That would be called confession through projection. Um, <laughs> on that note, good and, and this is a good question because you mentioned good YouTube, good entertainment. Obviously, you may have started with just the intention of, oh, we get a chance to hang out together, and that may still be there. 
However, you are growing a channel. You are a brand. You are doing something. So do you approach both subject matter? And I know Greg, I think, does a lot of the picking out. But also in your explanations, are you now aware that, okay, I can't get too in the weeds here. I need to make things understandable to the layperson. Any of you please answer. I think as we go, as, as, as we develop, we do, because man, those first ones, we were in there talking about research papers and getting all, and I was going way too deep. And I, I'll just say it myself. I was going way too deep. Now I try to, to reel it back and make it so my mom can understand it. My dad could understand what I'm talking about without getting into the minutia of it. I'm under the impression there are a lot of people out there that, that are into the minutia, but there's a lot of, more people that aren't. So on, on my part, I try to keep it just really basic and to, to the point each time. Yeah, I would say for my part, I don't try and steer away from anything that I wouldn't that I'm not interested in myself. It's like it's like when you uh, when you write Thanks, Robert uh, when you write children's theater, okay, or children's books. You write it for adults, and then you don't let them in. You you, <laughs> you go to the highest because for kids, there's only really one one thing I think that really kids cannot deal with, and that's sexual violence. And, and everything else is 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 actually that th there's a capacity to deal with it, and so you can create for kids all kinds of worlds that you create for adults, and then you just don't invite the adults. <laughs> and so for me, it's the same. It's the same for this. I'm going to make a show which I would like to attend, but I don't invite people like me. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like the Groucho that Mark. Be, that would be so tedious and annoying. Uh, you know, I invite people like everybody who's shown up for this, you know, cause that's, they're more fun. That sounds like Groucho like Marx. I'd never go to a club who would have me. Yeah, for sure. Remember, yeah. Sure. I'd never go to a convention where I'm speaking at it. <laughs> <laughs> but I, but I have to, cause you know, they pay me. Well, and, and in terms of what we select, I have a list of 50 names. A lot of them come from people on the show who put in comments during a show. We'll dig through those. I have a list of 50 names that we keep in reserve. And some of those you'd recognize right off some like Bernardo and folks like that. So we keep those on the back burner and we pay attention to the news because people want to know what's going on in the news. So yeah. are we paying attention to what people care about? Sure. But we also do it because we are interested in what's going on. Now, I'm not going to tell you I'm interested in a lot of pop culture stuff, but it just makes such good discussion when we bring it up and we see a person doing something really foolish that we enjoy it. So, yeah, we do pay attention. We are probably a little bit more succinct than we were in the beginning. But we don't. We still want to keep that level of detail on the show in a way that if we had a TV show, we wouldn't be allowed to do. If that makes sense to you. I sometimes do this, and I'm curious if you do too. And that's like, okay, I've given you, the viewers, the last five episodes. This one's for me. This guest is for me. And I hope everybody likes this guest or whatever it is, but this one's for me. Do you guys do that with cases sometimes where you're like, yeah, this one may not go over, but you know what? I want to know, or we, you want to know. Yeah, the we've got a few, one. and we yeah, we brought Jim people. Smith on. That was yeah, for Jim. nobody else. Yep. Yeah, for sure. Okay, and now Sadie has a question. Hi, and Sadie. Hey, Sadie. I definitely, and I want I want to qualify this one too because I think it's an awesome one. I want all four of you to answer, and it can be on the show. Or in real life, you don't have to name names, but I think everybody would probably really want to know that. What was the most difficult case slash person you have analyzed to date? Let's just one of us answer that. We've got a. That's your show, Eric. Sorry. <laughs> so okay, who's got the best answer? I mean, I, I love that. Are you mind melded? Can you tell me who's got the most powerful answer out of the lot? Scott probably has the best. Go, Scott. See, he says that because he knows that none of us want to say what it is because it's going to be different than the other ones. And the other ones are going to go, are you kidding me? That was easy because we haven't talked about that before. No. <laughs> so if we say who it is, my fear is they'll go, are you kidding me? That was fairly easy. That was an easy one. Well, you got you got knocked in the face once. I think that was a... I know, but I don't talk Probably about a toughie. <laughs> oh, then that's the one everybody wants to hear. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm talking about... I'm, I'm leaving all, all these on the show. Hmm. Yeah, I'm talking about from the from the from the ones on the show. All right, let's do the ones on the show since everybody doesn't want to say what's in real life. I didn't like this last guy, Gable Tosti. He's tough. That was the yeah. That's just 
he's such a goof and he's such a goob, you know, and he was just, he would sit there and, and I, I talked about it. So he was like a TikTok chicken. When he would move, his head would stay still, but his body would move around. Just odd, oh, dude. I, I didn't like, I didn't like this one. I didn't, that's the one that for me was the toughest because having to watch him and listen to him talk without being able to reach through there and just, you know, no, he killed that me. That interviewer was talking to him like a, like a dad. You were strained to Gable. <laughs> yeah. That's just that's 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 funny. That's funny. <laughs> yeah. But you'll notice nobody else is, is piping up about what they, the ones that they don't like. See, that's what I was talking about. Yeah, no, I, I think this one is among the hardest because he's little facial expression and it's just, yeah. 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 yeah I mean, out of that's uh, this one was a hard one. There's, there's the, the, the third, third or fourth video with the screaming in. That's probably the most harrowing video I would say we've we've looked at. And that woman and that who was, was the one sound. that killed her children. Who's that woman? The one that killed her children and called nine one one. That was Chase's one who Darley Rutier. Darley Rutier. Oh, did you see right, that Chase? No, she Darley Darley killed her parents. No, Darley killed her kids. No, she killed her kids. I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah, she killed her kids. Oh, yeah, right. I know these yeah, cases because yeah. they're all on my hard drive right here. Yeah, I thought that's one of the creepy cops, you had, Chase. If, if Greg ever gets in trouble where the cops have to go and see and look at his uh, I'm computer, in trouble. Search he's history? Done. He's <laughs> done. Search history. Yeah. And no, he bought himself a Chromebook just for the purpose. And when the cops come, <laughs> they'll be thrown out the window. <laughs> what the hell? Yeah, yeah, I'm in trouble for sure if anything ever happens. Have you guys watched any of The Written House? Because I, this is a question, it, it's from somebody who asked a question before. I'm not going to do a lot of repeats, but I, I think it is a good one, and it's Kyle. Did he demonstrate the grief muscle when he cried in court? And I don't know if you saw that segment when he was in under direct and started to um, break down. So we are we are avoiding a lot of commentary on the Rittenhouse case intentionally. Okay. I'll okay. Just leave it at that. If that's okay with you. No, I'm. I'm yeah. I, no, I'm going to hold a gun to your head and <laughs> say you will tell I'm me. Still not easy to kill. Was, <laughs> he was grieved. Yeah. No, we we just rather <laughs> leave that one alone for the moment. For the moment. All right. No. No worries. All right. So, um, Gavin Stone, thank you very much for the super chat. And let's see. Five English pounds there, sterling, Gavin. That, that's a pint. That's very exactly. kind of you. Well, is that why you moved to Canada, Mark? Is because your your well, currency the, the was even more by more no. beer, <laughs> more, more flips than I did. <laughs> it's like, all right. Um, Char B, question to Jerry. Mark or Scott: When a person Ooh, of else. interest gives a timeline of events, is there a way to quickly assess them for time blindness? due to disability during questioning i'll go with mark time blindness due to disability yeah i mean you you just you you'd go over that timeline and see how distorted it gets or frustrated they they get with it i would i would start looking for frustration as you go over the timeline and 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 now you're going to have to suspend your judgment around frustration might be them being deceptive about that timeline so now you've got to work out well why am i even checking for the timeline so all of these things i would suggest you've got to you, you've got to work out there's there's pluses and minuses to going down any of these these routes that's that's what i'd say about it scott what do you think i'd have them talk about it backwards i'd have them start at the end of the you, you start asking yeah. questions at the backwards. end of the story but you don't say now tell me the whole thing backwards but you ask them questions that would make those sections of the story stay in the same structure as they were when you went through. Because when you tell a story, when something happens, these things are, are connected by the emotions, the things that, that happens because there's something emotional going on most of the time if it's something important, big and important. So the, they should be able to tell the story backwards just as easily as forwards. They should know the story backwards and forwards. There shouldn't be a lot of, well, let me think. They should be able to say, oh, before that, he, he, before, they, you know, before he pulled out the gun, I, I did this. You know, if that happened, this happened. And when this happened, this happened. And she just click right back that way. But you don't say, tell it to me backwards. A lot of people say, tell me the story backwards. Right. But you have to do it so they don't realize that's what you're doing. 
So that would be my, my suggestion. But I think in this particular, if I got, if, if I have it right in this particular question, the question is about somebody who has a disability to that, who has a disability around, around yeah. timelines. Oh, so they, yeah. they would show so like, like, like legitimately have a problem. They would this. genuinely go, Oh, um, I see yeah, but, like I am with left and right. If you went, well, did you turn left and right? I'm going, I don't know. And, but people and show that in their baseline. People show that in their baseline. So yeah. when a person talks, they're going to talk about time, event, or sequence is what I refer to it as. An event person might say, I went to the barn yesterday. A time person may say at 2 o'clock, I went to the barn yesterday. At 4 o'clock, I came home. And then a sequence person will just give you an order. And that's their baseline. So when you hear it, you know that they're not going to use time. So you have to work differently then. That's human nature. On that, asking um, things backward, do you ever – ask the wrong question backward like if they told told you a sequence you'd say okay so that was on your way back from the store and if they don't correct you and say no um i was doing Greg's that good at that Greg, is that a, another way that you would um yeah eric story? exactly what you do is you want to let them think that they're winning telling you the story backward and then you may ask something out of place to break their sequence so that anything anybody who knows a story and they're telling you the truth Remember, I always say we knew this a long time ago. It's the reason people say they knew their story forward and backward because mm. it, it falls together naturally. You may not get the times exactly. You say, well, hell, it was, I don't know. I left at 2.30. It was about 2.10 when it, you know, you may have that kind of, that kind of vagueness, but usually it will not break the story by any stretch if they're telling the truth because all they have to do is think instead of make up something and try to untangle it. And at the same time, now you've got to be careful of your status with them, because if you have high status for them, they will placate you and they'll they'll agree mm. with you. Not because they're trying to be deceptive, but because right. they're in a situation where they feel like agreeing with you is is a is a better option. So it's so complex that um, that you've got to take every situation on its own merit and, 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 and play the instrument as you're as you're there in the room. There isn't a, there is there's not really though there are forms. There's no kind of sheet music for for every individual. Yeah, good analogy. Okay, on this one, since we're doing this, um, Greg, do you use a basic template type checklist when baselining people quickly? You know, I don't. I look at the person, I ask a handful of questions, just build rapport, talk to them. When we talk to Candace, for example, I just talk to her about her and get a smile, get them started moving and talking. And that's where you get a baseline from. Let the person talk about something not stressful. It can be anything. If I walk into a CEO's office, it's what's on his wall. I ask Chase, what's the thing behind him? You get in this conversation just to find a baseline for the person and realize that when you're actually in an interrogation, no one behaves normally. So the baseline is skewed to start with. You're just working from a skewed baseline to a new baseline. Okay. I'm going to ask this one because it's not actually going to force you to say anything about the current trial. But what was your experience like in doing behavior tests for jury selection? What do you look for in jury selection? That's a good generalized question. There's a lot of things you look for. And Chase can explain a lot better than I can. Um, but there, there are so many different things you look for as, as, you go, as you go through specific things as well. Chase, talk about that a little bit. You're, you're... He's quiet. Well, number one thing that we're looking for is locus of control. Some cases I want an external locus of control, which means the world pretty much happens to me. In some cases, I want an internal locus of control, meaning I create my own, my own life, and my own outcomes in life. The second thing that I prioritize is similarity to my client. So locus of control, similarity to my client, and finally, uh, their viewpoints about the archetype of my client so if my client is super wealthy how do they view those type of people and and what do they what emotions do they have around those type of people so i would prioritize those three things if you just lined up those three things perfectly with the jury you'd be about 80 percent done with the case give or take i'm not an attorney you'd have to ask barnsey <laughs> barnsey <laughs> see what he would say <laughs> It's like a football player, Barnsy. All right, Barnsy. Yeah, I know. Hey, wait, wait, Barnes. Oh, well, I know Barnes is in the chat, and then Greg took off. I don't know if he's still there. I had a question. Uh, yeah, no, I'm here. I, my battery was dying. I had to go adjust something. Oh, good, because this one's for you. Um, and I think it's an interesting question. 
somebody, they think it was you, Greg, who said you can be truthful without being honest. They yes. want to know what you meant by that. So if I ask you a question and you know what I'm trying to get and you give me the answer because the question was open-ended enough for you to get away with it and you give me a truthful answer and knowing what I wanted and avoiding, people do it all the time to you. If you don't ask exactly to the letter what they think you should ask, they avoid the question. They're being resistant to telling the truth. Yeah. So they're being truthful with facts, but they're not honest. Yeah. Greg asked me what I did uh, yesterday afternoon. Yeah, what'd you do yesterday? Well, uh, every single day I go, I leave the office, I go straight home. Just about every single day. Set up, Scott, set up straight. Yeah. <laughs> and redirect. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, guys, that that's that's exactly it. And you may ask, hey, were you, was there anyone else with you when this happened? Yes or no. And you know I'm looking for something else, but you avoid the actual question by giving me the answer to the question I asked. And then usually what they'll do is speed up to get away from the topic. Back to that question that someone asked in the very beginning. Their cadence will speed up so they can get away from the topic. Now, do you, do you immediately dig into that or do you ask a couple more questions, let them think they're getting away and then kind of swing back to it? Well, one more, one more thing, just one more thing. What you do is you let them roll, you let them run down shaft and redirect, and then you pick where you redirect, not them. And you bring them right back to the topic at the most opportune time. And it becomes kind of a verbal slap in the face. And they realize you've been tolerating their, their BS for that long. You come right back to it. Who's the puppy, Chase? This is Allie or oh. Allison. I Allison. That's a cute dog. That's a cute dog. Hiccups. I have an Allison <laughs> as a partner on News with Booz. Okay, this is an interesting. I'm not sure where they're going with this. Um, do you need a psychopathic tendency to enlist in the military with the knowledge that you may kill other people, or is that more like a cult member psych? That's I don't think it's either. I don't yeah, think it's I either, don't either. But... Well, becoming a surgeon, a nurse, a paramedic, a police officer, or just about any other job that helps people. Uh, entails you might actually kill people. So that would make about a third of our country a potential psychopath at that point. Well, and, and I always try to remind people, lots of soldiers put their life on the line for people from other countries, not not even their own, just to protect them from harm's way. I mean, mm -hmm. there are many soldiers who do that every day and who do humanitarian missions and all that. I think if you're if you judge it to be psychopathic, to be willing to lay your life down to protect somebody, then yeah, we are. But if you're if you're thinking about what we do, deterrence is the greatest military force possible. The, the more dangerous we are as a nation, the less likely we are to go to war. That's human nature. I mean, and certainly to, to Chase's point there, I've worked with a lot of surgeons and many of them you would, would come out as being psychopathic. And those are the ones that you would want to do your operation because they will be dispassionate about you, but they will be absolutely accurate with the scalpel. And they will, they love the accolade of that. They love- And the narcissism for the reputation will be very important too. Totally, they, they, it's for the award. It's like, you, you just go into their, you just look at the certificates and the awards and the and the black tie events that they're gonna show up to. And it's like, yeah, the, they wanna get it right for them. Not for you, for them. And they're really good at it. And it's like, well, who cares at the one. end of the day? <laughs> give, me that, give me that one. They have zero bedside manner. Right. Well, that's why you're under. You, know, <laughs> right. yeah, you're <laughs> you, know, you don't care. You you're want not. them to think of you as like a car or something. And, or a and, and, and if, they're about, if they're about to die under the knife, you know, it's such fine detail. Their hands are not shaking. They are rock steady because they, they just don't care. They breathe easy. They sleep well at night. All right. I think I already know the answer to this one, but um, or at least one answer, and that's a uh, talk to Jim Pyle. But this is a good one for all of you. How do you go about learning how to ask good questions? I think you answered it. <laughs> yeah. Well, J Jim's Jim is one of the best. I'd go to Jim number one. The, the, really, there it's very simple, basic interrogatives: it's who, what, when, where, why, how, how else, what else. And huh, if you figure unless, those out, unless you're yeah. making small talk, yeah. <laughs> well, then it's a different story. <laughs> so I would good say you've got, you got those, you've got, you've got those. And then the next level is 
the the value system you know what what is most what is most important about that you got who but who's most important and then how do you feel about that is another level and then what does that say about you is the next level of self reflection so there is there's the there's the questions that will get you data then there's the questions that will uncover a value system then the emotions that a people are feeling and then how they think about themselves so there's there's a there's a, a lot to it but but ultimately learning personally how to be curious is is be, be more interested in people it's curiosity you can come up with your own questions easily so long as you stay curious well right. I, I think you hit dead on that's what makes pile the best questioner i know is because he's got this intellectual curiosity he never gives up it's interesting all right now thanks for the super chat a fuzzy creature um I'm not asking about the trial, but the Rittenhouse trial gave you guys the potential to blitz ass assess people. Do you guys look forward to trials like others love trivia night, seeing what you can find in quick order? I'm yes. more of a so fan when I was of, young, I, go ahead, please, Chase. Please. I get more excited about watching Shark Tank and see <laughs> if I can predict who's going to win, who's not, which one's going to pitch before the person even finishes their first sentence. Hmm. I get more excited about that because there's less drama, there's less nastiness. We've already got plenty of that. So I'd, I'd just rather stick to shark. What's your record? I don't keep score. Are you usually right? Yeah. Okay. And just, just based on the stuff, like people who subscribe to the behavior panel, you watch a few of those episodes and just take three or four of those little tips and tricks and you'll, you'd be very surprised how much you can predict as, as far as human behavior is concerned. Just getting brilliant on the basics will make you more uh, dangerous oh, yeah. than anybody else in the room. Well, isn't that the law of diminishing returns, too? I, I would guess that, you know, if, if you learn, I don't know, whatever the basics are, that takes you 85 to 95 percent of their, the way there. And then it takes 20 years to get that last 5 percent. Or am I incorrect? I would say you're incorrect. Okay. Well, I think you can get held a lot fairly quickly as long as you are consistent and you're looking for baseline deviation. I think it takes a, a long time to get the mechanics of all the facial movement and those kinds of things and which muscle means this right. or that. I mean, Ekman's book is that thick. If you're going to use the facial action coding system, you're going to, it's going to take a long time. But you should, in fairly quick order, have the ability to recognize deviation from baseline. And that's a chunk. So in that way, Eric, I think you're right. If you're talking about the subtlety of it, I think yeah. Chase is dead on. There you go. See, they disagreed. <laughs> yeah. We do. We do disagree, too. Chase. What? It got ugly, too. Oh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm sitting right here. <laughs> it was the worst. Well, you saw Chase started to like kind of slink down a little bit more because uh, Greg, he's pretty intimidating. Yeah, no, I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> All right, to Mark discuss what the common folks wouldn't think of that you train the elite on this is open ended because he'd like you or i'd like you to decide the direction of the answer thanks mm -hmm. okay interesting wouldn't think that he trains the elite on well the same as i train everybody else on because that's the idea of well they're elite so they must have something very very different and they really don't they 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 bleed and cry and get upset and and worry and are crushed by the ideas of other people's judgments around them just the same as everybody else it's just you know if it's if it's somebody who's leading a country they're worried about that leader over there <laughs> probably not or they're worried about uh you know who's going to knife them in the back so they have all the same problems as everybody else so i don't train them in anything different than I would you if you came along and went, hey, give me some help. All, all I do is go, so what are you most worried about today? That's all, like I do with them. Get in the room with them and I go, so what am I doing here? What are you most worried about today? And then I fix that, just the same as everybody else. That might be a di bit disappointing. Um, <laughs> well, if that is be... disappointing, I'll just say, I have some really secret stuff that I teach them, which I can't tell you about. Okay. Yeah, okay. I was going to say, could it also be that they have the budget to uh, ah. keep keep getting more and more training over time? <laughs> no. Potentially, no. Oh. 
They're okay. trophies. They're trophies. They have, they have, they have so little power to to move money around. So you would not, honestly, you wouldn't believe how little they're protected, how little money they can get hold of, how they're super worried about about everything. It's just like, hang on, you're running a country and you can't even do that. It's it's extraordinary it's extraordinary i was with one and and i went to go to the bathroom and he was in the bathroom and and the secret service were outside and i said oh i'm sorry i just wanted to go to the bathroom i know i, I, I can't go in there and they went ah go on in you go <laughs> all right all right it's just me and him in the bathroom then is it all right <laughs> 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 like, they didn't care at all <laughs> oh that's funny okay that's um funny. this is actually i think a really important question and maybe all of you should answer this one um what is the biggest difference when questioning a child height dominance <laughs> okay pithy answer to mark no it's true height dominance like get down on your knees okay like we, most likely, if you question a child, I mean, I, I'm talking about I'm talking about in in the general world when I got to ask this child a question, I need an answer from them, and I need a, an honest answer from them. You are most likely to height dominate them, and so they're most likely to shut down. Yeah, first thing you do is do not height dominate them. Let them height dominate you. Mm. Then start asking you questions. Nobody else. I like to I goof throw. around with them for a few minutes first. You what? I like to goof around with them for a few minutes first. Get them giggling, tell them something, ask them a couple of questions about themselves or something that's weird. You know, get in, get them that way. That way they connect with you. Then once you can, you you find out how they see the world. Do they talk about things, or you know, are they interested in dinosaur? Depend on the on the age, of, of course. But what are they into? And then once you figure that out then they're much easier to talk to, especially if you can make them laugh and giggle for a minute. Even if, if it's a serious situation, that sort of that sort of puts them to the side a little bit of all the horrible stuff, and you can, get, you can talk to them, um, I think, a little cleaner and clearer at that point or get to them a lot easier. All right. Chase. Sorry, Chase. I think... Uh... Depending on what, what we're doing with the child, if I want information out of them about something that happened versus me communicating to someone who could potentially did something are two very different scenarios. Uh, but I think with children, it's a, it, it relies, I would say, tenfold more heavily on your ability to generate and maintain that child's focus and uh, attention during the conversation. So exactly what Scott said, ask them questions and get them talking about things that they're absolutely passionate about is the mm. number one way to generate and maintain focus. Is that kind of a baseline too? I mean, not to question whether there's lying, but if, if it's something they're into, then they're not going to waver on it or whatever. You, you should definitely be, even if the person's not a suspect child, you should, we should still be looking to see if they're telling the truth or not all the time. All right, Greg. Yeah, and I think children are less sophisticated. Everything we talk about with adults, most adults have gotten better over time. Most children are not sophisticated. They're poor liars. So you get a pretty good baseline pretty quickly. But I do think you, what you just hit on is important. You got to make them comfortable. That's Mark's first step. Make the person comfortable so you don't have height dominance. Get them to talk about something that makes them comfortable, something they want to talk about. And just what both of you said is getting a baseline. And then when you start to see something deviate in children, it's often much more pronounced than it is in an adult because we just lay down layer after layer after layer. And if you're talking about a very small child, they're learning to do all of those deceptive moves. They're learning to use words in a certain way. They're learning to use their body to cover things up. And so they're more likely to be more pronounced than an adult. Hmm. I'm curious too, if, I mean, obviously it's, it's good, you know, if a typical adult liar or whatever is to dig into things, but are there times that maybe as a child, you can see the deviation from the baseline, but it may not be healthy to go there. Just take note of it later to go into investigation or whatever else, rather than confronting them directly. I don't, I don't know if that's getting too into psychology or not, but. 
I'm curious. Well, I think it depends on what you're doing, right? If you've got a child in your life and you think something is going on, you definitely need to dig into whatever that is to make sure sure that it doesn't progress if it's something bad for the child or that. If it's somebody else's child, you probably need to be very careful how much treading you do on any other person's child. If you're an investigative or you're a psychologist, different story. But yeah, I think it depends, right? All right. <laughs> All right, I got a new fan here. <laughs> um. <laughs> Thank you, Pamela. Everybody's a critic. Everybody's a critic. <laughs> yeah, hey, just let, let, let me say this out loud. If you're listening and you're not a subscriber, subscribe to Eric's channel now. Yeah, do it. Yeah. Yeah, so especially like now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now you've had that, uh, that review. Uh, and the thing about Eric, you gotta, you gotta realize, Pam, is that we know him. It's, it's not like somebody we're talking to for the first time. And so we're s- sort of uh, going by the seat of our pants here as far as, yeah. as what we're doing. Boy, so it's not really a big fan. Anything. I'm telling you. Thank you, Pamela. <laughs> I, I should just, you know, recruit you to uh, do my Come publicity. On you, Come on, yeah, go again, look. Pamela. Hit him again. Come on. Yeah, please. Yeah, what do you Come got? On. Take him down. Take him down. Say something about his headphones. Make him, make him cry. I know. Hey, all right. That's, uh, that's pretty much all I got. Pamela, what do you got? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um <laughs> Oh, I, I don't even know where That's to go with this. Uh, I appreciate the super chat. I don't know if we want to answer or not. Now uh, let's get that. Let me get that out of here. Uh, yep. Dr. Jack Brown on Twitter. I, I shared a tweet of his that I found completely disgusting. And oh yeah, he, he seems to be making uh, stuff. I'm, I'm projecting. No, he's projecting like I am. Anyway, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know if you, do you guys want to answer that or no. I, all I saw is absolutist. You know, there are two schools of thought. Be, they're baseliners and absolutist. Absolutists believe whatever. If I do this, it means that. If I do this, it means something. And we are all looking for deviations from baseline. So we're all we're all going to be different than a person who's an absolutist. I'll leave it at that and be polite. <laughs> I've never seen the research on that. Yeah, yeah. I would just say yeah. Jimmy Crackcorn. I don't care. So, so yeah, there we go. <laughs> all right. Next to you, mate. Thanks for your tenor. Thank you, Julia Blair. Thank you, yes. Julia. Their Thanks, videos Julia. are the best. Hey, we, Thanks. we, did you see you got 200 bucks in there? Uh, that's 200. 200. No, that was 200. Um, I, I think it was another current. Danish Kroner. Yeah, oh, I think. Yeah, I think it's uh, about 10. If it's red, red is like um, getting up on the higher. It was orange. All money is good. Uh, oh, no, 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 no question. I mean, and I don't know what some of the currencies are like this one. Um, any yeah. thoughts on how siblings handle trauma, rough home differently, or children of narcissistic parents? Sounds like Scott. I, I don't have nuts. No, I, I know it's down in my, I thought you were going to say my parents are narcissistic. No, they're not. No. Um, no, that's my, uh, yeah, I know it's sort of down my lane. Uh, what was the question again? I'm sorry, I ADD'd out there on you just for a second. Any thoughts on how siblings handle trauma slash uh, rough home differently? Or children narcissistic parents yeah that's not really a specific question though on on how siblings handle trauma i mean it's yeah that's a, we're organisms guys. Guys. and we're organisms trauma is one thing that's traumatic to one person might not be to another or the level of trauma every one of us is wired differently thank god yeah all right here's an easy one chase what happened to the mk ultra documents you were planning on sharing they are on my site, on my website. Are they? Is it in a super quick answer? Oh, okay. Are they organized in an easy, searchable manner? Or how, how absolutely they... not. Oh, okay. <laughs> Chasehughes.com. All right. Uh, question for anyone Does telling the story many times make telling the lie easier? It makes it more comfortable. Hmm. Yeah. But how is it for you guys? Much. Does it make it's it more sometimes... difficult for you guys? You can tell when it's happened. You can you can tell when somebody's told the same thing over and over and over. A lot of the videos we're seeing, if we see someone who's told the story a thousand times, then you can you can see that on you can hear them. They just slide right through it, and there'll be little things they leave out, you know. So you have to go back through and if you can talk to them and get the and get those little things. But when we're, when we're watching videos of people, we can just tell they've told the story a thousand times. 
truthful events, you go back, ask them to kind of tell you again, and they'll they'll say, oh, I also remember. They'll add in things. Yeah. I, I think when a person has rehearsed something, they know which details matter. And to, to Chase's point, they add them in as they're talking. They don't go back and add something. They go, it was Tuesday. It was raining. It becomes a digital story. Mm. So what do you do about it? <laughs> That's when you start the backward. Remember, it depends on the life. It's a live omission. You go backward pass, you'll pick it up because people can't hide information in, in that backward pass. If it's a live commission, meaning they're making something out of plain cloth, your life is a photo album. Everything in that photo album ties together. If this incident doesn't tie together, then you got to go and say, what the hell is he talking about? There's a doctor recently that I was looking at the case, um, Dr. Kaufman, who had his wife killed somewhere up around you guys, if I remember right. I think it was around Virginia Beach. Anyway, the guy told everybody he was a Green Beret and he was a this and he was a that, but he'd never gone through any training, never disappeared for two years. So how the hell is he a Green Beret? You know, so that kind of thing, that photo album approach would take that story apart. Hmm. Mark, okay. what were you laughing at down there? Oh, just, 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 it's a great question here, which is, which is, have you ever interviewed interrogated twins or triplets? And I just hmm. don't understand why not go for quadruplets? Why not, why not like double down <laughs> and go, come on, let's, let's go for quadruplets. It's that just is a great so question. Super, it's just yeah, so super yeah. niche. But anyway, and then it, it did come to mind, uh, not that I ever talked to them, but if you, there are plenty of interviews of the Crays out there, the Cray brothers, Cray, hmm. Cray twins, and they're really interesting um, to, to watch. Very interesting. What, what is that? I don't know. The Crays. Oh, they're the organized yeah. figures in England. Yeah, yeah. I the think. Big, biggest, the biggest names in London gangland ever in in history of the UK. Legendary, mm. legendary. Yeah, to do them, that would yeah, be great. Nasty, nasty, nasty bits of work. What I about mean, the brothers, the Menendez? Were they twins? No, Menendez uh, brothers. No, no, they're just brothers. No, they're not twins. They're not oh, twins. okay. Okay. Huh, interesting. Um, okay, I I don't know. Question: Would Candace talk to you off air? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Would she? Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. Hmm. Caleb Crow, have you ever seen had someone try to monkey with their own baseline or bait you into thinking they are lying when they are not? You've never been married, Caleb. <laughs> Yeah, people do that all the time because they come up to they come up to us and go, "Well, can you tell if I'm lying?" And it's like, yeah, and they and they try and pull one on you, and it's like, I like, and you're like, "Oh, so you think nobody's ever tried to do this before, don't you? You think you're the first one. You you think you've got some grand scheme of how you're going to play this one out." So yeah, people people try and do that all the time. Yeah, and uh, it doesn't work very well. Yeah, the two truths and a lie game. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure about this one. Um, do any of you use symbolic logic when you're looking at someone else's argument? Mark, mm. what do you? I, I don't know. What, I don't know what he means by symbolic. I, I don't know either. But if, if he wants to know. clarify symbolic logic, then uh... yeah, the symbolic logic um, means that we're turning the other person's words into a fallacy by using kind of what Mark talks about a lot, like a, the symbols, the uh, an archetype. So uh, I think this is what this means. Uh, we're using this archetype. We, I could take a Disney princess or any kind of Disney story and ruin anyone's story by saying, this is just like this. They're telling you a story. And here's what happens next. But that's uh, pretty common. But uh, there's not a lot of arguing in the interrogation room. If there is, you're, it's probably not a good interrogator. Yeah, so for me, that if, if that's if that's the nature of the question, if that's the spirit of the question, then then that is, do you ever do you ever use and pay attention to people's symbolism when they're talking to you? And it's like, yeah, absolutely, because that is the symbols that they're creating and the way that they're placing those symbols are are a result of the culture that they're in, and 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 well, which is usually more a result of the culture that they're in because they're social mammals. So they've, they've come up with this stuff by listening to other people and using, as Chase was saying, these, these archetypal symbols. But, th but then would I start playing around with the logic of it? Well, yeah, I guess you could, you could start creating logical arguments and start to destroy the f potential fallacies of their, of, their, of, of their archetypes. Yeah. 
but but I'm I'm trying to make sense of the que- I'm I'm trying to help with the question here and make and make it into a question I could understand and it may not be your sure. question so so it's very <laughs> entertaining for me but you might be sitting there going Mark what on Man. earth are you talking about that's not what yeah, I'm so yeah. deep in that one Mark you well this one's good for <laughs> Scott um, because you've already got the shirt um, how do you um, let me see someone you know is lying how do you keep them from getting defensive you don't question about the lie. You want as much information as you can get so you don't go, what are you talking about? Wait a minute. Don't stop them. Let them lie. Get as much information as you can because pretty soon you're going to start asking about it and they're going to push against you most likely. Or you can say something like, you know what, uh, Eric, I've known you a very long time and we've talked to each other a thousand times. If there's one thing I can tell when you and I are talking, it's when I'm not getting the whole story. So was there something that upset you or you were you didn't want to talk about because you were afraid it was going to hurt my feelings? So I'll basically do a confrontation that way. So you still confront them if you need to. I'd say Or how is it yeah, how is it I've never heard that story? <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's see. Question for all. Do you ever just interview people at length for the purpose of paralleling them to sus to subjects in the future? Um, do you have a library of clips of regional accents and movements? I'm going to go to Mark. Yeah. Do you ever into? Uh, yeah. So I guess the question there is: Would I? Wow. Would I? Or we collect? I guess content that we'd be able to use when stuff comes up. Yeah. I think. I, I don't know. I can't. I don't. That's how um, the brain works. Yeah, so I've got a head full of the stuff. And so in my mind, I go, oh, I saw this thing. I remember this thing. And it's in my head, and I'll, I'll, I'll describe it. Do I have a collection of regional accents? Well, yeah, in, in, my, in my head. I mean, I'm from Britain, from the UK, where, where an accent will change over just several miles in a very, very small country. And so you absolutely need to know the accent that you're hearing so you understand how you're going to be judged and how you're most likely going to judge them because it will place you in a certain class, a certain specific area. I understand we had a civil war not not that long ago where neighbor killed neighbor across the whole country. So you really have to understand who am I listening to uh, because there's though it might might not be true that you're going to get killed by your neighbor, there is still a culture of that of do not trust the person in the village next door. So... So, yeah, I mean, because of my culture, I have all of that filed away in my head of who to watch out for and who's your friend and who's your who's your enemy. That's all I can say. A good say. example or a good thing to add to this was, was yesterday we were talking about or whenever we did this last show, we were all talking and, and Chase and I were all trying, trying to do our British accents. And Mark goes, well, that sounds like it's from this place. I can't do a very good one, but yeah. Chase can do a pretty good one. And so he'll, he'll start doing not only that accent, but the accent of the people that live around that accent. It's the weirdest. He came and just shot out like 12 of them. This one's this one. He goes, and there's that accent. And here's this one, mate. And mm. Does that one. And, and so he always has gas does... between. Sorry, say that again, Eric. He always farts in between. No, I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's Birmingham. That's a Birmingham accent. They do, you know, they do. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Birmingham. Sorry, Birmingham. Oh, well, there goes that subscriber a lot. <laughs> I didn't mean Birmingham. I meant Wolverhampton, obviously. Uh, oh, okay, and name a few are. more. Ooh, much more, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Wolverhampton. Just keep digging. <laughs> Sorry, Wolverhampton. <laughs> we'll eventually get the whole country. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, on that note, um, it, this is just a general one. Uh, have any of you just met a character and you're like, I need to talk to this person more because I've never met anybody quite like this? Or or there's somebody you've always envisioned or wondered about and you just hang out with them just to experience what they're like? Yeah. Yeah, that's... 40% of my friends are that way. Just characters. I mean, that's, that's those, those, they're fascinating in the way they approach things, the way they talk about things and describe things. Yeah. That's, and 20 yeah, of them I, are Kyle Dunnigan. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Great, perfect example. Perfect example. You know? So yeah, it's, yeah, I, lo- I love, I love those types of people who are just zoned in on one thing. And that's Kyle isn't that way, but, but people who have have one, they're a character. They are a, and everything they are and do revolves around that thing. But they can't help it because that's what they are. Dang it, I love that. It's one of my favorite things, and I seek them out. <laughs> as horrible as that sounds. No, I mean, all right. Um, question for Greg and Chase: How would you go about 
interrogating a person who has similar experience slash training to you. You gotta you gotta lean heavy on evidence. Or print out a bunch of fake evidence, but then it's it's pretty that. difficult. <laughs> Is that have everybody watch the Russell Williams interview with Jim Smith essentially? Well, yeah, but I will tell you this. He was not an interrogator trained. He was just resistance trained. When you add the mm. two, we know what we're looking at when we're talking to somebody, and it's a constant dance. If you were, if I were interrogating someone, if Chase and I were interrogating each other, he's dead on. We'd have to use facts. We'd have to use a tremendous amount of backstory and all of that to try to figure it out. The closest I got was there was an Iraqi interrogator held by the resistance in Kuwait, and I wanted my hands on that guy so bad, and they wouldn't let me have him. So, yeah, so heavy evidence or heavy theater. Yeah, which would be a whole other discussion, but yeah, and and then that guy should be able to recognize the theater. The two of us would recognize it from a, a mile away, and you would you know what to look for. You know what the approaches are. You know what the what resistance techniques. All of that that the person's going to try to use. So, I think you're dead on chase. It would take a lot of mechanics to make it work. That'd be fun to watch. <laughs> would be a dance. <clears throat> All right, Brilliant on the Basics was a Navy MCON, MC Pond program that failed miserably in the goat locker. Okay. This sounds I, dirty. Thanks sounds for like it's for a Chase. I think Chase knows <laughs> what it is. I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's a, I, I think the phrase is fantastic. I have no idea how it affected the Navy, and I don't give a crap. But I think the, fa the phrase is fantastic, that just mastering these things that are the foundational, the base of the pyramid, we need to master that first and then start moving up. Okay, hold on. Let me see if this is. Um, I mean, that's not really a question; it's a statement. Thank you for the super chat, though. Um, well, I'm under pressure. Pamela's going to yell at me because yeah, I have a on, question. Pamela. Pamela. <laughs> like, get him! Get Come him. on, Pamela! Pamela what do you got? Ridiculous, do Eric! It. Come on, Pamela! Get in there! I head. know. Look, he's down. He's he's down. I know. I jeez, uh, I'm taking forever here. Um, is it strange that someone is upset about you? What have the same hobbies or like hobbies, the same I color? Think, yeah. Is it strange someone is upset about you? Oh, I see what yeah. she's saying. Is it like if if oh, Chase and I both like sales or you know sailboats or something? Oh, would, okay, would I mean, feel weird about Chase habit, liking the same things I do. Like Cialdini, like if if the salesperson's coming up to you and everything you say, I guess um, they go, "Oh yeah, my cousin is." Da, da, no, she's da, da. what she's talking about is this. She's saying, oh. "Is is a see? Um, yes, that's strange. Is it odd if somebody likes the very same things you do, likes the very likes the very same food you do, the same colors, everything? I think when you first meet them, so wow. that that would be yeah. a bunch of things to watch out for. That's why. Oh, so it is Cialdini. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, okay. Yeah, and also at the same point, you got to understand that in part of part of a relationship process is usually infatuation at the start, and unconsciously you will start liking what the other person likes, and it'll happen really, really quickly, and then and then only over time you'll realise that you have you're now in a relationship with a complete alien, and now and and now you have to manage that situation because the brain is designed to to match up with people and to and to resonate to, so so don't always expect that just because somebody is unconsciously liking the same things as you're liking that there's something nefarious going on there's just something often human going on hmm. well yeah, yeah you're not going to pick um if somebody's into football you'd be like oh i hate football that's the worst sport in the world golf is the best thing is that what you're saying you, kind you of will unconsciously start to like football and then and then uh, you know six months a year into it when you're in this stronger relationship you'll go would you want to go to the football and the other person will go actually i don't like it very much and you'll go what I thought you loved football. It's like, no, I, I really, well, why did you tell me that then? Well, I don't know why I told you. I don't know. Well, how can I trust anything you say? Well, I don't, I don't understand. It's so sorry. You, you just, you're just dealing with the unconscious mind, which is designed to get on with people more than it's designed not to get on with them, especially when you're trying to find a mate. So, so this happens in relationships like that. all the time. It's called infatuation. That little, <laughs> it comes with a sound as well, Chase. And the sound is free. That costs. 
sound is free with it. Well, I've got you, Mark. Question for Mark. Yeah. What do you think about Toastmasters for body language communication? Um, I, I, I don't particularly rate it for body language communication because in my experience, what I've seen in sessions or meetings that I have been invited along to is it is, for my money, overly prescriptive around, around that and prescriptive of some elements which I think are not helpful. However, mm. what I think it is really good at is getting a group together on a regular basis to tackle the, the the trouble with public speaking, which is social social pressure and anxiety. And if you can get together in a group on a regular basis to deal with your fears, that's a really, really good thing. So I think it's it's more useful than it is unuseful. But if I was looking for specifically body language training, I would not be going to Toastmasters for specifically that. That's more for a presentation or practicing speaking and that sort of thing, right? Well, but body language is part of that. Nonverbal is a super important part. Sure. I mean, you know, otherwise I wouldn't have a job. I had, I would have <laughs> So obviously I'm a little bit biased around this. I just think it's fair to say from my point of view that Toastmasters doesn't do that very, very well. But I, I personally don't get together groups of people on a regular basis to tackle this, and they do. And that's actually super useful, uh, really useful. I don't do that because I'm not the kind of person that can organize that kind of thing or likes to be around a lot of people on a regular basis, to be honest. But is there a worry? And I guess where I go with it is, you know, sometimes you can learn bad habits from something. Is that is Toastmaster something that you'll have to wind up getting people to unlearn or have to train them out of, or is it relatively harmless? You're saying it's not to be all end all, but it's a good start for. No, I've, I've, I've gone along to. I've been invited along to Toastmasters things, and I've gone along because I want to see what these things are like. And I've and I've stood up and I've said, "Hey, let me show you some stuff about body language." And they've gone, "Oh, wow, that is like the total opposite of what we're being told to do." And I go, mm -hmm. "Yeah, you're right. Who do you prefer? Me doing what you." been told to do or me doing what I'm saying you should do and they go well it's much better when we do what you're doing and I go okay we'll do that then and that's all the training they need like you can see which is better do what is better you don't need to unlearn anything just do okay. the better thing I'm not saying what you're doing is bad I'm just saying what I'm telling you to do it's better and you know that so do that there's no unlearning required it's just right. it's just empirical obviousness all right this has popped up quite a bit and I think it's a probably an important one here for dating. Are there any great questions to ask to find red flags or anything to look for in um, social media, dating profiles, things like that? Uh, types of pets, no family photos, selfies, etc. If somebody has a horse, run. It's going to take yeah, all your yeah. money. Pictures, <laughs> pictures of people, hands on a horse is always. Yeah. <laughs> it take all your money. The, the biggest thing I go ahead. No, go ahead, Greg. I just stepped on you. Yeah, no, the biggest thing I think you find with people, the thing I'm always cautious of with red flags, and I don't mean just romantic relationships, is anyone who falls in love like that with you, be careful, be very careful. And I don't mean just in a romantic relationship. I know people who in platonic relationships are in love that quickly, and they just overwhelm the person because they need so much from that person. They're probably good folks who do that, but most of those relationships implode under the pressure fairly quickly. So and then I would say most of their friends don't live in that city or most of their friends are in another state. So they don't have any nearby close friends. They don't reflect empathy on their face. If you're excited, their eyebrows don't move. If you're talking about your sick aunt, they don't show any sadness on their face. And most of all, watch very closely. If the only time they get hyper focused or very interested in the conversation is when you're discussing something vulnerable about yourself that's probably going to be weaponized later. I'd Good say stuff. watch out for people who, who give you, who have too many selfies of themselves. Cause there've been a couple of studies on, on narcissists and uh, people who do a lot of selfies. So I'd, I'd pay attention to that. Make sure they don't have a whole ton of those. I have one. I don't know if it's good, but um, I always say, watch how they treat the staff like waiters and other yeah, people sure. when you're out. Sure. Yep. Um, Congrats to the behavior panel. You passed 30 million views total 
Amazing. Right. Wow. Happened today. We, I didn't even know that. Yeah. I didn't either. I didn't either. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah, I, listen, Thanks, I, I wrote it down on Thanks. a note to say, look, we got to we got to let people know that we did thirty million views, and and thanks, and Mark. Dan. Thanks, Dan. Going, hey. Thank you, you Dan. Thirty million. Yeah. Well, thanks, Dan. Yeah, hey, thanks, guys. Dan. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a fun ride, and thank you, Eric, for getting us all together. Um, yeah. I'm honored to know you. Um, oh, this is a good one for Chase. Ever use background music or sound in inter in interrogatories? Yes. I typically will go to a... This will get... I'll see if I can wrap this into 60 seconds. <laughs> There's something called binaural beats. Oh, yeah. I have to use this, you need headphones on, so mm -hmm. which you probably won't have in an interrogation room. And it's more... Binaural beats are not very effective for interrogation, you're more likely to be beneficial from a neuroscience perspective using something called isochronic tones, which turns on and off at a certain frequency. But the frequency that's that's playing turning on and off is called the carrier frequency. And you want to talk into an app, figure out the frequency of your voice and make that the carrier of that isochronic tone. Right. Chase that's Hughes, all, ladies and gentlemen. Chase yeah. Hughes. Now, yeah, yeah. Now I'm sitting here going, okay, so um, everybody take notes, rewind it four times, go start looking up the definitions of every word, <laughs> and we'll go on to the next one, which is an important one, actually. Chase, remind me to tell you a story. This has started your show. Mm -hmm. Will you be doing the Tiger King 2? Tiger King 1 is how you started. I think oh, we should have so. Carol Baskin on as a guest panelist. Carol, if you're cool. watching, <laughs> give us a join us. I, I can reach out to her. Yeah, yeah you, can. you can. You How can. How to get hold of Chase? I have my shoulder to prove it. <laughs> <laughs> well, who All would right. we who would we analyze if we brought her on? Maybe we could Joe Exotic. Who cares? We could analyze him with her on. That would be fun. Oh, that would be wild. Well, thank you, Sadie R. This is not past Hi, Sadie. Thanks, Sadie. Uh, all yeah, right. So, great show as always. Thank you. Trying to make sure there's no somewhere for chats. I'm looking to see if there's one question. Come on, Pam. Pam uh, here's the on. uh the twins or triplets. Yeah, I love that one. The cray footage for sure. That's a great yeah, we should look at that. Yeah. I, and I wonder if there are any who were ever arrested. That would be an interest. And that would be a question too. Would you interview them together or separately or do both? Because Twins react off each other in different ways yeah. than we're used to, right? And I don't know. I, I, I okay. I, I want to delve into that a little bit and just question with you because if you're dealing with twins, would you want to have more than one interrogator? Also, so you could both be observing one or the other to maybe because it's hard to track everything that's going on at the same time, correct? Well, two things. Number one, most interrogations are best separated. When you bring them back together, it's for a purpose, a very specific purpose. And you typically don't interrogate people together just because. Um, there are times that you might bring some of them together and force them to conflict and go at each other's stories. Especially though, especially somebody who knows someone as well as a twin would know the other person. Because now the subtlety of their relationship and the microculture, they can talk. We talk to each other with our hands across the screen. They can talk in ways you can't see. And they can share details that way. So you'd be very cautious bringing people together in that interview. That's it'd just be a nightmare for prisoners' dilemma too. Thinking so about this, if you were to go down the line of of which some twins feel, which is they are one entity, they are one person in two, you could go down the line that says you're never really interviewing any one of them unless you interview both. Mm. But that would be just a way of thinking about it, which could be true or false. But certainly to critically think this, there is an argument that says if you only interview one of them, you've interviewed none of them. <laughs> okay, so maybe interview them separately and then bring them in together and interview them together to see how they yeah. react. Yeah, and then and then like add something else for fun. Like, you know. Like a monkey, just like, <laughs> balloon yeah. animals. <laughs> yeah, okay, but yeah. but if it's quadruplets, then you give up because you're running no, out. Of I, think, I, just I think I think all bets are off now. Now it's now it's a three a.m. milk run. If it's if it's <laughs> if it's quadruplets, it's like I'm getting in the car. Let's go get milk. Uh, Carol, super Mark did not mean to say that. We're happy to have you. <laughs> yeah, on. Carol, I will not. Yeah. It is, honestly, if you come on, I will not mention the three a.m. milk run. <laughs> 
I'll bring my own You'll milk. be on his best behavior. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mark, will you give her $200 worth of milk if she comes on? I totally will. Oh, I totally <laughs> will. I totally will. There I'll deliver is. it myself. You've been challenged. <laughs> All right, Carol, All right, let's um, do this. You've been challenged. The Investigation Discovery Channel apparently has a long series on evil twins. So you wow. can maybe get there material there. There you go. Greg, take right. note. I did already. Uh, all right. Um, thank you, guys. Answered exactly what I was curious about. Okay. To hell with absolutists. That's I good. agree with Jimmy Cracking Corn. Yeah. And let's see. Let's see if we can get one more question. <laughs> I got to do this one. Right. We'll close on this. Question to whomever. What's up with the way Robert Barnes sits in his oversized leather chair, arms outstretched, never moves them, always stationary? He thinks he's that lets you Kirk. Know. That's the thing. He thinks that he's lets... Captain Kirk and, and the guy from, from uh, the... the... <laughs> yeah. No, that lets you know you never want him to be against you. You want to friend <laughs> up with that guy. Trust me. You want to be friends with Barnes. Whatever it takes, send him cigars, whatever it is. That that says you don't ever want to be on the other side of the table from that guy. And yeah, we've had dinner with Barnes three <laughs> or four times. We've we've eaten with Barnes a lot. He's like that in real life. He'll sit yeah. across the table yeah. the exact same way. Yeah, man. And so like, me and Chase are like this. No act. No, and Chase and I are like this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've, I've never met Barnes. Hi there, Barnes. Uh, but but in my view, it is it is Captain Kirk and Hannibal from the A Team. That's what he's doing. He's doing both of those together. It's fantastic. It's a great rouse. You're, you're going to love him. You're going to love him. He may not Unless see me a... now. He may not want to meet me now. I've said that. No more no, sidebar for Mark Bowden. No, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Greg, exactly. You, you have an answer? Yeah, no, yeah, I think it's just everybody has an image. Everybody gets to where they get and comfortable in who they are, and that's his. That's confidence. Yeah. Yeah, I'll go with the joy catcher on that. Well, maybe he just he's himself and makes chair. no maybe apologies. He just had that chair. Yeah. He's, he's comfortable like, in who he is. He's yep. got a chair. You just know you just nailed it. Uh the joy catcher. He he knows who he is. That's for dang sure. And makes no apologies. And on that note. Mm -hmm. We don't know who you are, but we know who your channel is. And thank you all so very, very much. And if you ha if you haven't subscribed to these guys, you're completely crazy, all 999 of you. <laughs> and got one more super chat. Thank you. Somebody's hey, up at 3 a.m. Hey, we know check Kay. this out. Well Hi, Kay. Kay. Wait. Hi, Kay. Thank you. Thanks, and Kay. All of you. Thank you. Thank you.